And uh, I am pumped up and excited for today's message. Today's message is called Raising the Bar. Not raising the roof, but raising the bar, all right? And, uh, but before we do that, would you please pray with me? Father, we just want to thank you so much for today. We thank you, Father, for the impact that we get to have with our life. And we just appreciate, Father, that you allow our life to, to, to make a difference in this world. And today we're going to see how we do that. That, Father, when we have you as the foundation of our life and we follow your principles, that you bring people into our life that we can, uh, that we can impact. And we thank you for that. And again, we pray that today as we talk about raising the bar uh, in our personal life, raising the bar as we go out to a world that very much needs you, Father, uh, that we really can make the difference that you intended for us. We thank you so much. Help us to have an open heart, open mind to today's message. We praise your son, Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so when I was thinking about this whole idea of this message, raising the bar, I started thinking about Father's Day. And for us, for a lot of people, Father's Day means so many different things. There's a lot of different emotions that can happen uh, with that term, Father's Day, with this specific day. But first and foremost, if you are a father and you are here, I want the rest of us to applaud all the dads that are here today because that is incredible. Now, here's the reason, okay? Here's the reason. Do you know that Father's Day is normally and historically one of the lowest attended weekends of the year when it comes to churches? So thank you for not getting that memo and being here and, uh, and you know, learning about God and how we can take our next step in our relationship with him. You know, but when it comes to Father's Day, we could all have different feelings, different emotions. If, if, for some people, Father's Day, you get really excited. Maybe you had a great father figure in your life. Your dad was there for you. He helped you through your life. And, and so, so when you think of Father's Day, you always think back of all those great memories, those great stories. Uh, for, for a lot of us, Father's Day is, you know, maybe brings up some painful moments, uh, some, some moments of, of neglect, some moments of, of physical, mental, emotional pain. Maybe the, your, your, your dad wasn't there, and so Father's Day really weighs you down. I know for a big chunk of my life, that was the case because I didn't grow up with, with my dad uh, in our home, so it was, it was a tough thing. Whenever Father's Day came around, I was always sad and depressed, and, and what was so great is this, though, is that I had certain people that came into my life that mentored me, that helped me. There, there were incredible men that, that, that you know, God used in my life to help me to see that there really is a whole other level. You can raise the bar uh, in our life and in the impact that we have. So if you're here today and maybe you're feeling down and depressed, I want you to know something, that we have a heavenly perfect father that loves you that accepts you as you are, that, that if, even if you've gone and you've made some bad choices in the past, he hasn't given up on you yet. He's saying the best is yet to come. If there's anything I want you to walk out with today is this, is know, is know that you are loved by your heavenly, perfect Father. Regardless of what any other father figure has done in your life, God is there for you regardless of anything. And so, so today we're talking about how, as you know, we live our life, how we can raise the bar in our life. And I thought, started thinking about back when I was in junior high and high school. You know, when I was in junior high and high school, we had this, we had this class, and the class was actually called P. E. And, and the reason I say it that way is a lot of kids today don't know what P.E. is. It's physical education. And you know, there are schools that have taken P.E. out of, 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 their, of the schools. They, they, they don't do P.E. anymore, which was crazy to take that out. Because as a kid, I know this can come as a shock, but I was very high strung. Yeah. And so I would get in trouble and it wasn't because I was trying to get in trouble. I was just a spaz, you know? So I was always, you know, very high energy. And so what was wild is this, is that right after the, the first couple classes, I remember that they would take us outside and do this thing called PE. And it was awesome. We would go out there and they'd make you run. You're, you're, you're playing kickball. You would have all these, you know, physical things. And it was the wildest thing. Cause I was like rambunctious when I got there, but after PE, I was tired. I'm like, Oh man. And that's when I could actually sit and learn, which is interesting because, you know, they take PE out of schools today and they go, why are these kids so crazy? Because you took out PE. Yeah, put it back in. Let, let them get that energy all out, you know. So, but anyway, we'll, take, we'll save that for another day. But, but, but in PE, what we would do is we would have all these different things that we would play and we would also have a track and field day where you would do all this track and field stuff where you'd run, you'd jump. And there was this one thing we did, it was called the high jump. And if you know the high jump, you know, you have a pad on the other side and you have this, this bar and you would need to jump over it. And you would always start like really low, right? Where everybody can just go, here, I'll just walk right over it, okay? And so you would walk over it. And, and then I remember when it got to a certain point where I couldn't, you know, I didn't know if I could jump over it, I would dive over it. And so I would just run and go, Foo! you know, try to, and, I, and I'd clear it and stuff. And they told me, no, no, don't do that. You're going to break your neck. And so the, the way you do this high jump is as the bar gets uh, higher, you go and you jump and you lean backwards and you kind of bend, your legs come up. I'm not that flexible. 
I couldn't do it. I can't even touch my toes, you know. So, so but you had to be flexible. You had to be, you know, light. You can jump over this thing. And the whole point was this, is that with, at the beginning of the year, they would check where you were jumping. And then throughout the year, they would keep raising the bar. And at the end of the year, they would assess did you improve? Did you go up to the next level? Did you get better? Imagine if that's the way we looked at our life as well. I want you to imagine the impact that we could have that if we faced our every day by not settling with something low, but every day we go, today I want to go to the next level. I want to take my life to a whole other place where God is going to lead me. God is going to take me. You know what's wild is that I had coaches and I had people that were there that, were, that kept stretching me. You know what? That's what the church is. The church in our life it, it are people that are here to say, look, I know it's easy to settle right here, but come on. I know you can do so much more. God has a bigger plan and purpose for your life. Imagine the difference that we can make. See, oftentimes the reason that our life does not accomplish, does not you know, have what God intended for our life, I believe is because we've settled with a low bar. I believe because he said, you know what, uh, it's, this is comfortable. I can just walk right over. It's wild how many people I talk to that are stuck in life. Where, where they feel like they, there's really not, not even a purpose. Like if they were here today and gone tomorrow, it wouldn't really matter. You know why? Because every day they just kind of go, my life is just a low bar that I keep walking over. There's really no significance in that. And God says, I don't want you to do that. I have a life of impact. A life, you know that every single one of us has an opportunity to impact generations to come. You don't have to just be a parent for that to happen. So today we're going to talk about the impact that we can all have. Now, I'm going to use some references because it is Father's Day to parents. But the reality is this, is you don't have to be a parent to, to make an impact. You can make an impact in your schools, in your job with your neighbors, with people that you like, people that you don't like, that God can use your life to make a significant difference. And so, so the key is this, is focusing on what's important, first and foremost. And do you know that when it comes to making a difference, leaving a, a lasting impact, it all starts in our home. Our home is the number one thing. It has to start there. Because if you go out into the world and you succeed, if you go out into the world and you have the, the best job, you make a whole lot of money, but you failed in your home, you, you, I'm telling you, you're going to feel like a failure. I've seen people who succeeded, who reached the top of the corporate ladder, only to look around and see that they didn't recognize their own family and everything fell apart and said, I feel like a failure. But I have seen people who have an incredible family that they love each other. And even when they lost that job, they go, we're going to be all right. We're going to be okay. Why? Because they focused on what mattered most. I was reading a story about a, about a coach. And he's a, um, he's a very successful football coach. And this guy, uh, I mean, he's been successful through his entire career. And they're interviewing him. And as they were interviewing him, what they did is they, they, uh, they asked him questions about his coaching style. They asked him questions about coaching. And, and it's crazy because this guy's football IQ is like beyond what you could fathom. I mean, such a high football IQ. And he talked about, you know, here's, here's what it means. It means coming in early, extra early, coming in, staying really late. It means, you know, going through and studying film and doing all this other stuff. And so they're like, wow, this is so great. That's what it takes to be successful. And as he's going through, explain to them what it means to be successful as a football coach, he drops his head and he starts bawling. And they're like, uh, what happened? And he said, I don't even know my kids anymore. He looked and said, I failed at the most important thing. Yeah, I've succeeded in that, but that doesn't matter. See, you don't have to be a father to know the impact that that has. See, so what we got to do, we, we have to do is focus on what matters most. And that's our homes. It's our relationships. So for the guys, let me talk to the guys for a moment. I want you to know that, that there's a lot of statistics out there. And there was this one statistic that I read. I was like, oh, my goodness, that's crazy. And that's this. In 2015, they, they, did, they did a statistic, and it showed there that when, you have, when, a, when a girl at a young age has a great father, father figure, or male mentor that shows them that they are valuable in the sight of God, that they actually have a better self-image of themselves, that they actually feel better about themselves, and that they have a, a, a higher chance of keeping themselves from giving themselves to anybody else. Why? Because, because they know who they are. It's the wildest thing. Now, there's another one. There is a, psych, uh, a psychological journal stated that when there is a great father figure, 
father, father figure, mentor in their life, that children have a, a, a higher IQ when they have a great father figure in their life. That children actually have better relationships, that they can actually relate with other people a whole lot better when they have that type of mentor. Now, ladies, I want you to know that, that if you, there was a Barner Research did, did a study, and in this study, they, they found out that if a mom or mother figure in someone's life gives their life to Jesus and is following Jesus with, with everything she has, that, that the chance of a child or somebody they're mentoring to do the same thing is, goes up by 17%. How awesome is that? It, it means that the kids are watching. But I want you to know something, men. That same research showed that if men, they love Jesus with everything they've got and they're impacting their, their kids they're, in, they're mentoring kids, that it jumps up to 93% that they would accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior and live their life for Jesus. How crazy is that? The world needs men to step up and be God's men. See, this reminds us the next generation is watching and we have an opportunity to, to make an impact. But oftentimes people say, well, how do I do this? How do I make a difference? Because there's so many things to get involved with. What do, we, what do I do? The Bible tells us in the book of Deuteronomy, here in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, it starts this way. It says this. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. He says, that's how you do it. That's how you do it. That if you love God with everything you've got, with all your heart, with your soul, it penetrates deep into you. That you listen to God's word, that you, that you open up your Bible, that when we, when we come to church, it's not just about hearing words, but we're going, what is God telling me? What do I need to do to take my life to a whole nother level? It says, love God with everything we've got. Jesus talked about this. That there was a time when someone came to Jesus and said, Jesus, what is the greatest thing I must do? It's known as the great commandment. Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your might. It says, it says that we need to love him with everything. We, you know, he was just quoting this. And then he says, and the second is just as important. Love your neighbor as yourself. It says that the way we do this, the way we have a, a, a life of impact is to love God, to follow God with everything we've got and to love people the same way. And that requires a commitment. See, but when we are committed to going, now this doesn't mean you're gonna be perfect. It just means you keep going and you take your next step. But, but what it means is this, is that if you are committed to it, you have an impact. Now, the reason I say committed is that because sometimes it's going to be tough to do. I want you to know that. See, there will be days that the days are long and hard, and it's hard to keep moving forward. Because that verse in Deuteronomy, I, I want you to know, that was written by Moses to Israel, God's people who were in captivity. And they had long, hard days. They really did. They were in captivity. They were slaves. They were actually, at, in that moment when he wrote this, he says, love God with everything you've got. They were in the middle of these long, hot days. They were in the desert. They would go out, and they had to work the fields. They had to go out, and they would make bricks in the heat of the day. Uh, they were mistreated. They, you know, it was manual labor. It was long, hard manual labor. And he says, look, I know things are tough, but stay focused. And it's hard to do. I tell you, this week alone, I, I, I was going through, I had some conviction as I was going through this message because I was, um, this week was a long, hard week for me. I think uh, Sunday through Thursday, I didn't get home till after 9 p.m. every night. And I got to tell you, I was feeling sorry for myself. I'm like, man, nobody understands. Mm -mm -mm. You know, and and I, so I was feeling sorry for myself. And, and then I, as I'm sitting in my air-conditioned office working late, and then I realized that these, these people had something to complain about. They were in a horrible, horrible situation. And then you would think that as God took them out of captivity and was going to lead them now to the promised land, because that's what God promised them, and God takes them out of captivity and leads them to his promised land. And what was wild is, you know, when, when, they, when they took them out of captivity, they assumed that all of a sudden, boom, they're going to be at God's promise. But that's not what happened. They had to still journey to God's promise in their life. And while they were there on the journey, when God takes us from, from captivity, God takes us from our brokenness and leads us to his promise that there will be long days on the journey. You have to be ready for that because Israel, God's people weren't ready for that. And there was a point when God takes them, he's like, I'm going to take you over here. And they were so excited about God's promise. But on the way, they decided that they wanted to quit. Look what it says in Exodus chapter 16, 
verses 3 and 4. It says, The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. If God, if only we would have stayed in captivity. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you, talking to Moses, have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instruction. God says, look, it's the craziest thing. They wanted to go back to the old. Why? Because the new was tough. If God is going to lead you to your, the promise into your life, you have to expect that it's going to be tough, that the journey will be tough sometimes. The days will be long. If God's going to lead you to the promise in your marriage, you're going to have tough days in your marriage. If God's going to lead you to the promise as a father, as a mother, as a friend, you're going to have tough days. And if you don't prepare yourself for that, just like the Israelites, we're going to go, I want to go back when the bar was lower. God says, no, no, I, I'm raising the bar because I want, to, I want you to see where I'm going to take you. And I promise you that when, where I'm going to take you, it's going to blow your mind, but it's not going to be easy. Have the right perspective. Keep moving forward even when the days are long. Now, here's one thing I've realized as I've gotten older is that, yes, the days are long. Man, you're like, man, this day is never going to end. Have you ever felt that way? But the older I'm getting, I'm realizing that the years are short. Have you noticed that? It's like the days are long, but the years are short. I'll, I'll give you an example. Today is the second week in June. You know what that means? That this weekend is dead center. Half of the year is already done. 2019, half of 2019 is already done. Doesn't it seem that sometimes all we do is we blink and those year, that time is gone? I'm, I'm, as I'm getting older, I don't even have to blink. I just go like this and they're gone. It's crazy. I, I just have to look back and, and it's over already. I'm like, what is going on? And, and as you look around, I, I got to tell you, uh, when I jump on social media, especially during like May, June time frame, you see all these kids that are graduating up and I go, what? I, they, were, they were babies when they started coming to the church. That's crazy. You know, or I see now, back when I was a youth pastor, I was a youth pastor back in 2002, and I see these, these people 17 years ago that now they're in their 30s. The people that were my youth are in their 30s, and they're married with kids, and I'm like, what? But it's not just out there. Even in our own homes, we can blink, and the years go by. You know, this, this last week or a week and a half ago, my, my wife and I were going through some pictures, and she took out these, these little... Um, it's not negatives, but they're like proofs of some pictures from back in the day. And on these proofs, they had our kids. And they had my, my daughter Mariah when she was a baby. Like I'm talking about she was a preemie. And so when she was, you know, she was so small that what we would do is we would dress her up in this uh, ladybug outfit. But it was actually off of a doll. Like we actually took it off the baby doll and put it on her. And, we're, and we'd take pictures of her and stuff. And it was the, I'm like, that is crazy that we just, just saw this. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. And now she's married and out of the house. What? What? My son, who was little mini me, is now going into high school. I mean, he's already in high school. Going to senior year of high school. He's going to be a senior. I'm like, what? What? That's insane. My youngest daughter, the baby of the family, is, is going to be a freshman. And I'm like, there's just something wrong with that. That's just, I, I, I still remember putting him in the car seats. And I remember it because it scarred me deeply. What is up with car seats? I have a degree in engineering, and I can't figure out a car seat. And, I, and I'm talking about it happened at every point. With my first kid, I'm like, okay, I'm going to have this by the second kid. Nope, they didn't have it. They, they end up changing the formula. You know, it's crazy. <laughs> now they have this little, the ones you clip in. So, okay, those are a little easier and better. You know, but it's crazy. And so I go, they were just in a car seat, and now here they are. They're all taller than my wife. It's insane. I know that's not you know, really tall, but, but still, you know, they all taller than my wife. And here's what I realized in James chapter four, verse 14, it says there that this life is but a mist. It's here today and gone just like that. So it then reminds us to stay focused on what matters most. Focus on what's important, that we have an opportunity to have our life make a difference even though it's a mist, it's here today, gone tomorrow, that we can literally make a difference for generations to come. I love what it says in Psalm 90, verse 12. In Psalm 90, 12, it says, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. It says, God, help us to know that our days are numbered so we don't waste them. 
Because here's what I found out about life. Church, I have found out that in life there is no rewind button. How many of us would love a rewind button? Absolutely. Every single one of us. We would all love to hit rewind and fix something, do something different. I've talked to a lot of people that they said, I wish I could hit rewind because I focused on all the wrong things for so long. And now, now I'm over here going, I missed all of that. You know what, you know what stinks about missing those things? You won't get it back. So today, we can walk out of here saying, I'm not going to miss anymore. I'm, I'm going to walk out of here and I'm going to focus on what matters most. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep moving forward. And I'm going to keep looking at what really matters in my home and in my family. You know, I, I, I saw this Pinterest thing. It was the most amazing one. I loved it. It was a Pinterest, and, and this, it was like a, you know, this kid that made a huge mess. There was all these toys, you know, behind them. And, and on the Pinterest, it said, please pardon the mess. My kids are making memories. It says, you know what? I know you're going to come in and judge me on my house, but I don't care. Because this right here is what matters the most. See, I believe that when we focus on and, and understand that, yes, the days will be long and they're going to be tough sometimes, but they're so worth it. And, the, and our time is limited. So let's make sure that every single day we live it to the best. I'm telling you, it changes our heart. It really does. You know, I love that song from the famous theologian, Garth Brooks. <laughs> that says there, if tomorrow never comes. See, that song is talking to Somebody with her spouse saying, if tomorrow never comes, will she know how much I love her? Says, if tomorrow never comes, did I focus on what matters most? Is my love and what I did enough, enough to sustain them if, I, if I'm not here tomorrow? And I believe every single one of us right now, we can go, you know what? I can take it up a notch. So that's what it comes down to is going, how do we do this? Let's take our next step. Let's live our life as if. Tomorrow never comes. Will it be enough? Now, oftentimes when we get moments like this, we walk out here going, that's it. I'm going to do something big. I'm, I'm going to do something, you know, huge that's going to just change everything. You know what's wild is this, is that we can do big, extraordinary things in ordinary moments. That, that God uses just our ordinary life to make a difference. See, because back in Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, when, God, when it said there that we're supposed to love the Lord our God, with all of our uh, heart, with all of our soul, with all of our strength. You know, you're going to go, I want to do that. How do I do that? Here's what I love about God. God is so good. He goes, the very next two verses, he goes, now here's how you do it. Here's the how-to. That if you want your life to, to make a difference, to, to leave a lasting impact, it says this in verses 6 and 7. It says, these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Carry it in your life impress them on your children. See, he says, teach your kids. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, as you live out your life and when you lie down and you get up. You notice it didn't say when you get a stage. What it said there is that your number one ministry is your home. You know, that, that's what God says. For, for all of us, our number one ministry is our home. It's our family. And so much so, God puts such a big emphasis on it that in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, it says that as pastors, it says that, that someone cannot be a pastor if they can't manage their own home. It actually says that their number one ministry is their home, and if their home is falling apart, they shouldn't be leading God's church. I mean, that's how big God says this is. Because if I'm succeeding as a pastor, but I'm, I'm failing as a father and as a husband, I shouldn't be up here. It says, because why? Because our number one ministry is our home. It's the people that God brings closest to us. And it says there, how do you do it? The way you do it is by being an example. When you get up, when you lie down, as you walk, as you live out your life. It says, seize those moments. I want you to know something about people around us, okay? And this is true with all of you. It doesn't, you don't have to be a parent for this to be the case. That things are better caught than they are taught. Here's what I mean by that. That you can try to teach someone with your words all day long, but if you're not living it out, they're not going to get it. Uh, I'll give you an example. If you, you can have your kids and you can teach your kids all about love. 
You can make them memorize every single verse in the Bible that talks about love. But if they don't see you living out a life of love, they're not going to make the connection. They just won't. And, and, or, or maybe you, you're talking about how God is a healer. That God transforms lives. That God can take the broken and put it together. And God takes us, he makes us into a work of art. That we are God's work of art. And you're teaching your kids this stuff. And you're saying, look what God can do. God can heal anything. But if you're walking around bitter and broken, they're going to walk around bitter and broken. They're going to go, this doesn't make any sense. You know, we can tell our kids that they are made in the image of God. That God created them as they are, on purpose and for a purpose. That, that when they look in the mirror, that they can be proud of what they see. You can tell them all of that, but if you are constantly being negative about your own physical body, I promise you, that's affecting your children. See, oftentimes we believe that the only way we can have great teaching moments is if everything's perfect. If you're waiting for perfection, to lead your families, I want to make you a promise. It's never going to happen. Because it's funny because people tell me, and I've had people say this to me. Well, pastor, it's easy for you. You're a pastor. Your life, I see your wife and I see your kids. They're great. I mean, no wonder it's easy for you to lead your home. Everything is perfect. Everything is great. God just gifted you with perfect people in your life. Sometimes I just go, you know what? Bam, Jesus will forgive me for that one. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I don't do that. I don't do that. You know, I'm like, are you kidding me? There was a lot of brokenness. My, my wife and I came from broken homes. There was a lot of brokenness that we worked through. You know, my, my kids, it, it, we work very hard at teaching them and showing them and, and being the examples. And I want you to know something. It has never been, okay, I have been in ministry now for 17 years. My kids know nothing else other than, that we are a Christian home. And I got to tell you, never once have I walked through the door, walked in, and my kids come up to me and say, Father. <laughs> oh, Father. <laughs> we want you to know that every chore is completely done. <laughs> I know the dishes wasn't on the list, but Father, we did it anyway. <laughs> and now... You, in all your wisdom, would you please sit with us and read to us from God's word? <laughs> Never has happened. Never has happened. See, we try to wait for all these perfect moments. That's not what it said there in the text. It says you make it happen. As you live out your life, they're watching. As you make God a priority, they're seeing it. You know, yes, you lead them and you help them. See, it's saying every single day of our life, our home is our number one ministry. Now, here's the thing that happens is that often when it comes to life, we get all excited. We're like, yes, Pastor Juan, I want to raise the bar in my life. But often the reason we're afraid to raise the bar is because we had the bar really low and we kept tripping over it over here. Have you ever noticed that? That because we fell when the bar was low, we go, I can't take it any higher. Are you, I can barely jump over that. When in reality, you can just walk over that. We make it harder than it is. See, but, but sometimes we, we go, well, where is the bar really? Because if you think about it, as society, the bar is always moving. It can move in like a second. I'll give you an example. When you look at social media, we can have an idea that the bar is so high that we'll never attain it. You know why? Because people always take the, the best pictures and put them on social media. Have you ever noticed this? Where, where you will see somebody on social media and they have filtered their life away. They have put every perfect moment into their life. And they're going, look how amazing those people are. And then you look at your blemished life and you go, I can't measure up. You become insecure. Like, I'll never be that. I want you to know something. They can never be that. That's called filters. And, and so I don't want us living life looking at a filter thinking that is the standard. But then the other thing about society, it's crazy. Because that's the way it is with, when it comes to physical stuff. But then when it comes to morals... We bring the bar way down here. We go, you know, why should we set it high when just do what you want? We, we live in a society that says the bar should be so low that you can just walk over it because you know what? Whatever makes you happy. I want you to know something. That when you cross that bar, uh, you're never challenged. 
And the happiness is temporary. See, it's when we have progress in our life that everything begins to change. We have to be careful about who sets the bar. And we have to be careful because sometimes religion tries to set the bar too, even at the time of Jesus. See, the Bible tells us that we're supposed to have a relationship with God, but religion tries to come in and say, you know what? It's all about meeting certain expectations. I want you to know that the reason you follow God is not to meet an expectation. The reason you follow God is because you have received his love, his unconditional love. He looks at you and says, I know you're a broken person. And just the same way that a child looks at a father and says, you know, a good father and says, I want to make you proud, father. That's why we follow God. And, and so, so we live in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a religious society as well as, that, that looks at people and says, you didn't measure up to my bar. There are churches that teach that you cannot go into that church unless you wear a suit and tie. Every week. That that's the only way. You know what? And if somebody wants to wear a suit and tie, by all means, wear a suit and tie. Awesome. But don't say that's God's standard. Because Jesus wore sandals. Jesus didn't wear a suit and tie. You know, so, so the thing is, this is great if people want to do that. Awesome. But don't say that that's God saying that. You know, the religious rulers during the time of Jesus, you know, the Pharisees, it was the wildest thing where God will give us a principle for our benefit. For example, the day of the Sabbath. The God says that the day of Sabbath is for us to rest, to recoup. Why? Because he made us and he knows we need rest. If, you're not, if you don't rest, you will burn out. And, and the other thing that rest does on the Sabbath, it also shows God we trust him to take care of our needs. That I, I can actually, you know, disconnect and just focus on what matters most and let God handle the provision. That's why we need a day of rest. But the Pharisees came in and added all these different rules to the day of rest where they said, okay, well, here's what it means. It means that the day of rest, you cannot work on that day. And then they went in to define what work was. You cannot cook. So I guess you had to eat cold food, I guess. I don't know. I mean, you couldn't cook. Uh, if, if there was a fire, you couldn't start a fire, and you couldn't turn off a fire. So if you decided to cook, and you had a grease fire, you just had to let it go. And they're going to be like, hey, you shouldn't have been cooking in the first place. You know, that's what you get. You know, I mean, it's crazy. It's crazy. So they added all these different rules. And Jesus comes along and says this. He says, they're not the standard. It's pretty awesome because Jesus comes in in Matthew chapter 5 and he fixes a lot of the things that the Pharisees were saying. But people always believe that Jesus came in to go, I know the Pharisees are telling you to do this. So Jesus goes, here's what you need to do. Just, it's a simple, just walk over. Actually, that's not what Jesus did. Jesus looks at the Pharisees and says, I know this is what you're saying. I'm raising the bar. Jesus actually raised the bar if you look through Scripture. See, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus goes in and has this conversation. says, you have heard it said, but I say. And he says all these different things. In Matthew 5, 21, he says, you have heard it said that you should not murder. He says, that's great. Don't murder. But I say that even if you are angry and have hatred and you call your, uh, your, your friend, your brother, Raka, which means a fool, that you are wrong as well, that you have judgment for that. And he, you go, What? Jesus says, it starts with the heart. He took it a whole nother level. Yeah, you look in, in Matthew chapter 5, in that same chapter, verses 27 and 28. Listen to what he says here. He says, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. He says, before the physical thing happens, you have to know it's a heart thing that happens first. And Jesus says, I care about your heart. And through the whole chapter, Jesus is saying, you have heard this said, but now I say. You have heard this say, but, but now I say. He goes, let me tell you, this is where the bar was. I want to go a step further. And then Jesus ends the whole conversation going, now let me tell you that if you want to make a difference, if you want your life to matter, and, and you're, you're going to try to do it without Jesus, by yourself, without Christ, he says, here's the standard for life. Verse 48. He says this, therefore, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. There it is. He says, all you have to do is be perfect. Okay. Don't you just love when it's applicable like that? Never get it wrong. You're like, okay. Now, the whole point of what Jesus was saying there is this. The whole point of the whole Sermon on the Mount is to say this. You can't do it. You can't be perfect. You're going to drop the ball. Happy Father's Day. See you guys next week. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, no, I'm not going to leave you there. I will not leave you there, all right? So, so here's what he says. 
He says, look, you can't meet that standard. But it's okay because Jesus met it for us. That's the whole point. The good news, the gospel, is to let us know that, look, you, you're not going to be perfect. You're not going to always get it right. But don't worry. You have a heavenly father that loves you and sent a perfect sacrifice for you. The Bible talks about it. gives us fancy word, propitiation. All that literally means is to fulfill what is demanded. That's it. It means that Jesus Christ came and fulfilled what was needed. This is why in Matthew 5, 17, before he went into all that, Jesus says, I did not come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. He says, I came to meet that standard. See, Jesus says, I set the bar of perfection. I jumped over the bar. I then grabbed the bar. I snapped the bar and I made a cross with the bar and I paid the price so that you never have to worry about that bar again. It's not about you trying to be perfect. Don't try to meet someone else's standard. He says, I, you have a loving father that accepts you as you are. But then he says, but now you follow him. Now what we do is this, is that the reason we follow God is because God says, I want your life to make a difference. Don't be a Christian that accepts the sacrifice of Jesus and just takes it easy every single day of your life. Your life won't make a difference, I promise you that. And at the end of it all, you're gonna be as miserable as somebody who was an unbeliever. God says, I want you to be somebody that looks at the example of Jesus. Now, we're not gonna be perfect this side of eternity. I want you to know that. You're not gonna be perfect. We're not gonna be perfect until we get to heaven. This side of eternity, but Jesus says, but don't let that stop you from getting it back up. Keep moving forward. Follow my example. Matthew 5, 16, in the same way, let your light shine before men that they might see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. That by the way we live on our life, we can make a difference. See, too often we get so caught up in the stumble, Jesus says, I'm here to lift you back up. I'm here to lift you up. I love what C.S. Lewis said. C.S. Lewis once said this. He says, if only we had the will to walk, then our heavenly Father would be pleased in our stumble. Here's what he was saying. That if only every single day we got up and we decided to keep moving forward, that even when we stumble, God will be there and say, it's okay, get back up. I'm right here for you. You know, that's what the, ch the church, the church is not to, be able to walk in these doors and come in with a filtered life. The church is to come in here all blemished and all and to have somebody come alongside of you and say, hey, it's, it's not over yet. Let's get back up. We're here with you. Let's keep moving forward. God is right there for us. It, it reminds me of like a baby. Think about it, a, a baby. When a baby first begins to walk, and, and we know when they first start walking, they, they do the Frankenstein walk, right? The, you know, that's, that's what the, the way a baby first starts walking. And, and you don't look at that baby when they're trying to walk, and you go, why are you walking like that? Come on. You should, all, you know, you should be from over there to over there. Let's go. And then you, they, they go around the coffee table and fall. You don't go, hey, should have avoided that. You deserved it. No, you don't do that. If you do, you got some issues. We're going to talk about that. You know, but, but here's the thing, is what do you do? When they take that first step, you're right there. Listen, once the, the one step happens, your heart is like, oh, you're so happy for them. And when they fall, you go, come on, let's get you back up. All right. And now they take two steps. And then when they fall, you don't go, what's your problem? You go, let's get you back up. And little by little, their walk begins to happen. I'm telling you today, some of you just need to know God's lifting you up saying, let's come on, keep moving forward. Don't give up. I have a bigger plan for your life. Yeah, yeah, I know you've messed up, but today you can choose a whole different way to live. Let's take your bar and let's move it up. I've got a plan for you. Listen, God has a plan for every single one of us. And if you're here today, if you don't have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, I want you to know how loved you are by God. The reason God raises the bar is because he wants good in your life. That's why. We have a heavenly father, a perfect father that says, I want good in your life. And the way good happens is by not settling when you're down, but to keep getting up and going up and take another step. And so that's what God wants for you. And if you are not there, if you're going, look, I'm struggling. Listen, that's, we're here. You can talk to us after the service. We are here for you. But maybe some of you right now are saying, look, I'm ready to get in the game. I'm ready to start living my life for Jesus Christ. And if you're here today and you're ready to do that, right after the service, please go over to the Red Connections table. The pastors will be back there. I'll be right up here. We want to talk to you about helping you take your next step in your relationship with God. We hope you consider Christ this week. Let's go ahead and pray. We'll get finished up for today. Father, we just want to thank you so much for today. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity that we get a chance to remember that you want all of our life to make a difference. 
Father, we know that as we struggle and we go through times in our life where we've stumbled, it's hard. Father, help us to remember that as you lead us to, to your promise, that the journey will be tough sometimes. That sometimes we're going to want to quit, we're going to want to give up. But Father, but if we do, we'll never accomplish, we'll never get to the place where you wanted us to. We thank you for loving us so much that even when we stumble, you never give up on us. That you're there for us, that you believe in us. You lift us back up and you help us take our next step. Father, we love you so much. Help us to be a church full of people that doesn't want to settle with a low bar. But instead, Father, every single day, we want to stretch ourselves to be the people that you intended and created for us to be. We thank you so much. We love you with all of our heart, Father. We praise your son, Jesus' name. Amen.